Hi, everybody. Welcome to Kickstarter 101, starting your comics project. My name is Jamie Tanner. I work here at Kickstarter. Uh, I help people with their comics projects. I have also created four projects myself thus far, so I'm not totally unknowledgeable about what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, so what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about comics and making comics using Kickstarter. It's a really wide world of things you can do with it. Um, how many of you are, I assume you're all familiar with what Kickstarter is generally? How many of you have backed a Kickstarter project before? All right, that's a good show of hands. And how many of you have uh, created Kickstarter projects before? All right. All right. Then what I'm about to say will be very familiar to you, but I'll get through it quickly, and then we'll get to talking to some amazing creators we have with us tonight. What do you do with Kickstarter? You create something to share with others. Kickstarter is about bringing creative projects to life. Uh, tonight, that'll be mostly making comics, bringing comics to life. Although it is a broad universe of creativity, we have 15 different categories. So the basics of Kickstarter is you're, just, you're creating something to share with others, and that thing fits within one of these categories generally. Again, tonight we'll talk primarily about comics. But first, a little bit about Kickstarter in general. To date, there have been 81,000 projects plus uh, successfully funded with over $1.6 billion pledged, which is absolutely insane. And there have been uh, over 8.2 million backers to date, and over 2.5 million of those have been repeat backers, which means they've gone on to back more than one Kickstarter project, which really speaks to the, uh, the vibrant community that's, that's building around projects uh, that are here to support creative work, basically. And that community in comics is particularly strong, which uh, I hope to show you tonight. And those repeat backers are you know, pledging more than half of what goes to projects. So this, this community is really growing, these people who are sticking around to see and help projects come to life. And those people come from nearly every country on the planet, even Antarctica. That's not a country, that's a continent. From every continent as well. So how does it work? Again, a Kickstarter project must create something within one of our 15 categories to share with others. Again, tonight we'll be talking largely about comics. And comics are a very inherently shareable thing. Generally, people are saying, I want to make this comic. And people are backing that project to get the comic and read it themselves. Uh, projects must be honest and clearly presented. Uh, this is not just a rule, but it's, it's a, good, a good thing to do. Talk about what you're doing. Communicate it very clearly, and you'll, you'll find people who want to support it. And projects can't fundraise for charity or offer financial incentives or involve prohibited items. What does that mean? It basically means uh, no charity because this is a space for creative projects. It's about bringing creativity to life. Um, it's not about offering equity. And prohibited items is basically things that are illegal or dangerous. You can't really you know, offer guns or drugs or things like that. I think we can all agree this is a, a good thing. Here is a Kickstarter project, a Kickstarter comics project that is live on the site right now. Uh, it is a travelogue comic, which I think is a really Interesting use of comics. Um, autobiography is a typical, uh, a standard genre in independent comics. I like this specific focus on uh, ex travel experiences. That's one of the things I want to talk about tonight is the sort of breadth of the comics category, all the different kinds of things you can do. Uh, you can see that their goal is $3,000, and they are, they're almost there. They're, I think, about 85% funded thus far, but they've got a, a 23 days to go to be funded. That's the mechanics of how it works. You decide how much you want to raise. You set a time to do it. Typically, 30 days is the, the, the standard amount we recommend. And then uh, if you reach that goal, you uh, successfully fund your project, and you can raise well more than you ask for. Uh, if you don't make that goal, then the project isn't funded, and um, no one's cards to charge, no money changes hands. You know, every, that's it. It's the all or nothing funding model. Uh, why all or nothing funding? Uh, because it works. It's a very effective. Uh, way to do this. It's less risk. If you know you need a certain amount of money to make something, uh, this ensures that you will get that amount of money to make it. So, you know, rather than ask for a certain amount, if you only get less than that and still have to make and deliver this thing, it makes it really difficult to do. This is a much safer way to do it. And it's compelling, too. It creates urgency. Uh, you know, it's a, a lot more motivation to pledge to a project if you know, like, it's only got this much time and it needs this money to do it. Overall, about 40% of projects are successfully funded on site. Um, I'll show you in a little bit that that's actually a bit higher in comics, which speaks to the uh, vibrant community I was mentioning around comics. This is kind of a, a strange statistic. Basically, it just points out 
saying 17% of unsuccessful projects don't get a single pledge basically means that of those projects that don't make it, usually it's because they're not telling anyone, they're just putting it out there, hoping for the best, but without reaching out to build this community and not finding any support. Generally, you'll either be successful and raise more than you want, or you'll fall, you know, you won't really find much of any support at all. It's not, it's rare that something is in the middle where you're almost to your goal and you don't make it at the last minute. Like generally, you'll find out that, you know, you'll, you'll be successful or you'll, you won't reach out at all or tell anyone. And here's something else that illustrates that 79% uh, of projects that raise more than 20% of their goal wind up being successfully funded. That's, uh, that sounds a little strange. It sounds like if you hit 20%, you're automatically successful, which isn't really the case. It, again, just speaks to the fact that like, if you've raised this relatively minimal amount of support, around 20%, then you're you know, building that community, and you will go on to be successful in 80% of the time. That's pretty good odds. So a lot of the projects you hear about in the news raise large sums of money, but uh, most of the projects on site raise between one and $10,000, which is actually a very reasonable, realistic amount to shoot for, um, especially in comics. You can make comics for relatively little means, which makes it a very strong uh, category on Kickstarter. So let's talk specifically about comics. Um, to date, there have been over $37 million pledged to comics projects and uh, over 2,600 successful comics projects. Uh, that one up there is a slide from uh, Little Nemo, Dream Another Dream, which is this giant oversized anthology printed at full uh, broadsheet size, which is I think 18 by 21, which is the size that newspaper comics were printed at in the early 20th century. And it's a tribute to Windsor McKay's Little Nemo, the classic comic strip done by modern cartoonists offering their take on it. It's a really cool book. And as you can see here, 50% of comics projects typically are successfully funded, which is 10% higher than across the board on site, which again, just speaks to, you know, people like comics. People want to make them and people want to read them and they come together on Kickstarter to make that happen. The average funding goal for a comics project is around $5,000, again, right in that area between one and $10,000. Uh, but the average amount raised is 12,000. So, you know, people are shooting for these reasonable amounts and when they are successful, they're typically more successful than they are aiming to be. And the average pledge to a comics project is about $50. Here's another cool thing that we recently, uh, we recently did a blog post about uh, repeat creators, which we're seeing more and more of as time goes on. And as you can see, comics is the category with the most repeat creators on all of Kickstarter, which again just speaks to uh, the community for comics on Kickstarter and also the usefulness of Kickstarter to people making comics. It is such an effective method that people keep coming back to do it again and again. And it's also a, a lot of fun to do, so it's kind of addictive to keep doing these projects. And speaking of creators, let's bring up tonight's <laughs> creators. Uh, Hazel, Molly, Ray, would you like to approach the chairs? <laughs> there we go. So, uh, Hazel Nulevant, did I pronounce that right? Yes. All right. I was stressing about that. Uh, her project actually just successfully uh, closed its funding campaign this morning, Chainmail Bikini. Yeah, give it up. Uh, Hazel is a cartoonist and editor living in Queens. She graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 2014. Her comics have been awarded the Zerich Grant and the Prism Comics Queer Press Grant. Uh, she's been playing Magic the Gathering for over a decade and is interested in the interplay of gaming in real life, she tells me. Uh, yeah, and this project was uh, an anthology uh, about uh, women's experience playing games. Molly Ostertag is the artist of Strong Female Protagonist, uh, also a graduate of SVA, now working full-time as a cartoonist, and her project was to create a print collection of her uh, webcomic, Strong Female Protagonist. And in the middle there is Mr. Ray Sumser, uh, a New York-based artist and cartoonist, and creator of nine Kickstarter projects so far. There's a small sampling of them. And uh, Ray has done, uh, he did the first issue of a kid's comic, as well as these giant um, posters featuring thousands of comics characters, and a big collaborative drawing where you could pledge the project and have your work be incorporated into the drawing. He's sort of a one-man example of the variety of things you can do on Kickstarter and in the comics category in particular. So let's get into it, starting your comics project. Uh, every Kickstarter project is a story. 
uh, as we like to say. So we'll talk about all the elements that go into, or the basic elements at least, of what you should have in your project and how you go about telling your story of what you're making and bring people on board. So here's some basics. You have your project video and your, your project description as well, which is kind of the invitation to the project to invite people to participate and tell them just what you're doing. Uh, the rewards, which are your way to share what you're doing and offer people like a, a token of that creation. And project updates, which is how you invite people even further into your process and uh, you know, engage with them in an ongoing fashion, uh, since it says ongoing engagement right there. Let's talk about project videos a little bit. Personal, short, shareable. That's a good pithy way to describe what makes for a good video. Here's a few quick tips to keep it short. Again, uh, I said uh, under three minutes here. Under two is great too. Although really you can do a long video if it's a great video, people will watch it. But doing something short is great uh, and be clear and compelling. Be yourself. I often recommend that people put themselves in the video because people will respond to you as a creator as much as they will to what you're making a lot of the time, but it's by no means essential. But I like to encourage people to make that video true to the spirit of the project and to you as a creator and you know, to enjoy making a video. Um, do you guys have any tips for like what you enjoyed about making a video, what you recommend? I know um, at least Ray and Molly, you put yourselves in the video and I think you did a drawing of yourself, right Hazel? That's one way to approach it as well. Yeah, I sort of came in the middle between being personal and also being shy, but you know, I recorded my voice talking about the project and mostly just used it as an opportunity to show samples from the different comics. Right. So that was mostly the visuals rather than my face because I figure that that's not really what people are pledging for. One never knows, but that is definitely a, like the first thing I recommend to people asking about starting a comics project is show some work. Comics is is great for that too. It makes it easy. Comics is a visual medium. It's inherently very easy to share. You can just put those pictures right there and people will immediately uh, get an idea of what your project's all about. I think of it as like picking up a comic off the stands in a comic store and flipping through it to see if it's the kind of thing you like. Ray, what about you? I know you've done nine projects. Did your approach to videos change over the projects? Or? No, it's still pretty much the same formula from the first one that I did. And for me, I feel like if you have a, a core concept that people can get, then you could remove yourself from it. But uh, I felt like putting myself in there, what I found over time is that people, the backers really actually want to relate to the person who's creating the project a lot of the time. Um, uh, to such an extent that in my very first Kickstarter video, I, I picked up my cat mid-video and held my cat in front of the camera. <laughs> and I got so much positive feedback to the cat in the comments that then the cat became the main character in the comic book that I then created later. Um, this is no secret. Cats and Kickstarter is a very successful combination. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, think, I think if you can present your personality and get past you know, whatever camera shy stuff, uh, it's, it's good, good to, it helps. Molly, how about you? Um, yeah, I agree that I think it's important to make a video, um, but we at least figured, my um, collaborator and I, that like, People are backing this. It's a comic project. It's not a video project. And so like the video could be very kind of just honest and simple. And like we didn't have to stress about like having it be edited perfectly or be shot really beautifully. Um, so I think like just like recording a really simple thing of us talking and like showing our passion and our earnestness was I think all that like could be expected. And like that it seemed to work out well. I'm glad to hear you say that. I think that is great advice. Like I definitely, when I did my first project, was incredibly stressed out about recording myself speaking into the camera. I, I mean, in comics, cartoonists are not necessarily known to be the most outgoing uh, uh, species of people necessarily, or the most, uh, you know, camera, the opposite of camera shy. What would that be? Camera savvy. Camera savvy. There you go. But I mean, if you if you make that leap and do it, it can be very rewarding. But even if you don't, if you aren't, if you just aren't comfortable putting yourself on camera, just doing some kind of a video, even something very small, and as long as it's sincere and true to the project, I think, as you said, that's definitely what is effective. People really do respond to that stuff. What about like structuring your project description? Do you guys have any tips on that? What worked for you? What did people respond to? Having a good balance of words and images, being like very, very clear about sort of what it was, what we had already created, what we needed to create. And just like, for me, I found like, just like the sort of 100% honesty, like this is who we are, this is what we want, this is why we can't like pay for it up front. And like, 
this is what we'll use your money for. Like being incredibly clear, I think, is like refreshing for people, um, and just like uh, it's it speaks well. So. All right. Anybody else? Any tips for building your page? Well, I definitely second what Molly was saying. I would also add, I guess, dividing it up into clear categories mm -hmm. like rewards, expenses. Of course, for an anthology, I had a list of all of the creators involved. And then, you know, samples of the work has to be among the categories. Yeah. I have a pretty short attention span, so like, I, and I'm not a great reader. So like, the sh like as when I look at a project, like the less text there is, the quicker I can get it, the the happier I am, and the more likely. I, I mean, if I'm going to support a project, I'm going to support a project. But I think being succinct and to the point, and maybe not like using too much flowery language, or you know, uh, you know, say what you need to say. Yeah. Although I think that some people really want to know the details, so maybe like a simple explanation in the beginning for people who just want to read that and then like getting into like if you know who your printers are like what that is or like history of your project or what you like think it will do to change the world um, like you can there's room for that but like yeah having like a short section at the beginning to like get the bullet points was really important. Yeah, that's a great point. Even with like a video, if someone does a longer video if they're really clear about what they're doing very quickly right up front that can that can go a long way to yeah. getting people to watch it as well. So let's move on to rewards. Uh, most typically, the core reward is a copy of the thing you're doing in some form. In comics, that's typically a physical comic book or a digital download of a comic or something like that or whatever it is you happen to be doing. Uh, but it can also be some artifact of the creative experience or like an experience with the creator or like a custom thing or something like that. Um, here's some quick. Uh, Stats about rewards. The most common pledge across Kickstarter is $25, um, which is often where people will put their sort of core thing. If they're you know, uh, printing a book, they'll often have the book at the $25 reward level. But again, this really varies. It really depends on the details of your project. You'll know better than anyone, or, or should know anyway. Do your homework a little bit and find out what it'll cost you and you know, what's reasonable. Um, we generally recommend like five to seven rewards, but in comics, that will often skew higher, I feel like. People are. Uh, very savvy in, comic, in comics and very particular about what they want, but I definitely advise streamlining rewards as much as possible if you can, uh, figuring out the sort of core things you want to offer or what the most popular combinations might be. Um, and this is interesting to, you know, $100 being a tier that generates the most money across the site. You know, if you have like a $100 or a higher reward, uh, it may not be the most heavily backed reward, you might not get as many backers, but, you know, even a handful of them will wind up contributing significantly to uh, to your project, so it doesn't hurt to have something uh, a little bigger in there. And I just wanted to call out a few um, cool rewards from everybody's project here, just to like give some examples. Uh, so here's from one of Ray's projects, the entire cartoon universe. This is one dollar reward, and I think this is a common reward across a bunch of your projects, where for a dollar you get to suggest a character that he'll work into the piece. So for anyone pledging any amount, like just a dollar, you get something really cool. You actually get to be part of the, the project that's being created. Um, so definitely don't ignore like having something of real value at a, a pretty low pledge amount because people might be inclined to, to pledge that might not have otherwise. Um, for Molly's project, here's a cool um, special print that was only uh, ever going to be available through the Kickstarter project. So and again at like a reasonable level, so it's a way to get something extra that you might not get elsewhere, like a special edition of the book or a print or something like that. And from Hazel's project. Um, uh, this is a cool custom $100 reward where you could uh, have one of the artists in the book. I believe Molly contributed one of these as well. You could say, uh, do, draw my character for me from you know, a game or what have you. Uh, so some sort of custom art is common in comics as well. Um, what do you guys think? What were some of the rewards that worked best for you or what didn't work? What do you like best in a reward in a project? The ones that sold out like immediately for me were um, books with a custom doodle in them, and it was a limited tier because mm -hmm. um, like hands only last so long, um, <laughs> and so like that that was awesome. That sold out so quickly. Nice. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think custom drawings or individual drawings is like really the way to go in the comics category. I feel like I've I wind up inventing higher level tier uh, rewards that then just become such a headache because they're kind of adjacent to the main thing I'm focusing on and drawings I'm going to do anyway. So, Yeah, although that's a, a good tip to, you know, limit those rewards if you don't know if you'll have enough time to do 
all of them, you know, it's great to offer this, but if, let's say, 100 people need a drawing from you, that's 100 drawings mm -hmm. you need to do. That can add a lot of time to your project. Though, if you're willing to do it, I say go for it. But, yeah. you know. but I'd rather do 100 drawings than, like, you know, figure out how to make 100 more of a whole separate product at, at this point when I, when, I, when I look at it. How about you, Hazel? Uh, with Chainmail Bikini, I tried to organize the rewards so that I wouldn't have to produce too many other physical items other than just the book. I did end up doing a little print similar to the one that was shown for Molly's, mm -hmm. but other than that, the only physical thing is the book. Like all those character commissions are digital, so we don't have to worry about shipping. Um, another thing was original art that already exists. That was some of the higher reward tiers. Um, yeah. Definitely something I a lot mean, of comics projects do offer original art. Again, a very inherently shareable medium to work in. Yeah, I'm definitely all for having patches and t-shirts and all the other associated things that people are into, but the problem is that you have to raise your funding goal, actually, to be able to produce those. So I just wanted to, to keep it achievable and simple. I tried to have it be focused on the book. But yeah, these commissions were really popular. I think we had four different artists each doing like 10 commissions. And that's cool, because that's not going to be my problem in terms of fulfillment. <laughs> <laughs> Create rewards that other people can make for you. This is a good yeah. tip. Um, yeah, I also I used my rewards, because I draw an ongoing webcomic, to kind of test the waters for what people would be interested in buying as merchandise, and to kind of have an excuse to produce like a bunch of t-shirts or, or a bunch of prints or something. Um, and I found that I think t-shirts were pretty popular. Prints were really appealing to me because they're easy to ship. You can just put them in with a book if they're small and like they're easy to draw. But I think they weren't quite as popular. So um, yeah, I, but like when I was thinking of fun rewards, like that print of the characters playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, like that one was exactly the size of the book, so I knew I could just slip it in, and it wouldn't charge me any extra shipping. This, um, is, a, this is a sneak yeah. peek of the 201 uh, discussion oh, to yeah. follow this, the rewards and fulfillment shipping, discussion. Yeah. I, I happened to be talking with my colleague Craig, who uh, was working on his presentation for that, and uh, one of the tips he had in there was keep it flat. So if yeah. it is a print or something, yeah. if you're shipping a book, you can just slip it right in there. And honestly, like you should be thinking about that as you're building your project. Like, yeah. what's the prints? I did a bunch of them because they were so easy to do um, that I could I can sort of like experiment and see what people thought of them. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely great to be ambitious and try to do something huge, but definitely prepare in advance and think of practical things you can do too. Yeah. I def I like to encourage people to stay small sometimes too and think of a little thing. Did you guys have much success with? Um, Digital rewards, I always encourage people to include some digital version because it doesn't yeah. cost you anything to ship and you can offer it really inexpensively. Yeah, the digital version, it was amazing how many people backed that and that was like just literally no money out of my pocket. It was just me sharing a comic that I'd already drawn. And you can read online for free, but I gave them the PDF of it. I'm amazed that people backed it at that level. But I think it's a cool, like, to have the, like, I think we had that for $10 and to have, like, you want to like give some money to this project, but maybe you don't want the whole book. Um, it's it's just cool to like have that option there. How about you guys? Any thoughts on that? I mean, samesies, you know. Samesies, it was we're in agreement. Cheap and easy, <laughs> and yeah, there was, um, yeah, definitely a few hundred people wanted just the PDF of Chainmail Bikini. I think that's what I've asked so. for. All right, so it's a no-brainer <laughs> for the Jamie Tanners of the world. There you go. Follow they my want lead. the PDF. Read digital comics. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll move along then. Two updates. Yeah, this is. I always like to urge people to think about updates even before they've started their project. Start thinking about how you'll talk about it, how you'll share it, how you'll keep momentum going, or how you'll invite people into your process, things like that. Um, so again, I called out a few examples from everybody's project. Oh, is it not playing? Oh. This was a great little animation that Hazel posted of her dancing and celebrating. I'll do a demo. There we go. It looked like that. <laughs> so this is one way people use updates to during the funding to like update people on how they're going. They reach their goal. They celebrate. Talk about other things they might do. Oh, there we go. All right. It's hypnotic, but I'll move along. Um, uh, from Ray's work, uh, there's a shot of him working on one of his pieces. Um, I think you've included time-lapse videos 
of like actually drawing the thing, which is a great way to do it. It's actually even easier than ever if you have like an iPhone or something. Like you can just hit a time lapse button and it makes a video really quickly. I've tried it myself. And there's like a chart to all the characters in one of Ray's pieces. I, I always encourage people to share their process as much as they feel comfortable with. Some people are very secretive, don't necessarily like to talk about it, but especially on Kickstarter, it is like people really want to know that stuff. And you know, it'll be really rewarding. You'll get a re great response, I found, when you do that stuff. Um, or once your project is finished and you want to update people on shipping, for example, which is a, this is something we see in a lot of comics projects, the giant pallets of books in boxes. Uh, this is from Molly's project. You guys want to talk about updates at all? Uh, what updates do you, did you like doing? What do you like to get from other projects? What did people respond to? I noticed that people really I, I'm, I'm like, I think I'm a hands-off like backer where I back it and then I'm like, I trust you, like go for it. But I think a lot of people liked to hear about the updates and hear like how the project was going, if there were any delays in shipping or delays in production. Um, but I kind of still like, tried to take the like very honest and earnest approach of like just every time there was some kind of milestone, some kind of like new reward that I decided or like the, we sent the PDF off to the printers or the pallets had arrived or whatever um, to just like let people know and kind of like try to like share my excitement um, so that, you know, the people who are following along like get excited about it too. When uh, a lot of friends come to me and ask me about uh, what to do to start a Kickstarter project and like, you know, what's the right way to go and I always say like, okay, so you launch your project and then like you immediately do an update that's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I actually launched the project. Like, it happened, because you should just start. Like, I think, I think about a Kickstarter month as being like, this is a time when I'm going to do the Kickstarter, but it's really a month where I'm focusing on this thing all the time um, to work on the project and get it done. Because if you're doing that, you're going to create all the little chunks of stuff that you can be sharing, and you're going to have stories to tell. Um, and then that just makes for easy updates. And beyond just the initial project, um, I've found that with my updating, and I've been, I, I'm pretty compulsive about updating when I'm working on a project. And updating, you know, if you wanted to be someone who like would do 10 Kickstarter projects over a span of time, those updates like endear people to you. I have a, a lot of my projects, I, I have luck early on with people because people will come on from a previous project because they've gotten to know me through updates in the past. So beyond just building up your one-time Kickstarter shot, like you can actually build a, a, a network and, and relationships with people that way, and that's uh, pretty powerful. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I guess haven't... it's early days. Yeah, for you, I but... haven't gotten to the phase of having to provide updates on how the reward fulfillment is going, but that's definitely important. I primarily used updates to let people know about um, stretch goals that we were hitting since we hit the initial funding goal early on, which was great, but most of the stretch goals were about giving the contributors to the anthology more money, so um, when we started hitting those, I would send out updates being like, hey, thanks backers, thanks to you, all the artists are getting... 50 more bucks and you know if you want them to get even more money like tweet about it or tumble about it or whatever um, so I used it to share that and also positive press that the project was getting I mean I know these people are already on board but it's still pretty you know exciting and I'm sure somebody who already backed the project if they read a positive review of the book would be just more psyched about it um, and Another thing similar to what Ray was talking about, about building the community, mm -hmm. I haven't done this, but I saw somebody else that I backed their project do it and I thought it was really clever. Um, somebody who did like a book of essay comics about Stephen McCraney, St something, whatever. So he used one of his updates like a year after the book is done to be like, hey, I'm working on this new graphic novel and like, oh, you could vote for it in this contest because like you still have this address book of all of your fans essentially. So, I mean, even after the reward fulfillment is done, you could theoretically 
let them know about the new thing that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. We were talking about this beforehand a little bit too, about you know these people care enough to support you financially before you've even finished the thing that you're doing. They they inherently care to hear from you about how things like they're on board. They've yeah. they've told you with their dollars that like we care about what you're doing. We want to know, and I think the more you well, you don't want to bombard them with too many updates, of course, but um, you know, communicating, reaching out and communicating with this community you're building, like you'll find that they really respond to that stuff too. And actually, just I think it was last week we enabled um, Spotlight, which uh, for a long time, uh, up until this month, basically uh, a project would end and it would be basically frozen in time, a like snapshot of that moment when the project uh, ended its funding campaign. But now you can. Uh, change the sort of header image and uh, the updates are pushed to the front so you can like keep telling the story so anybody who comes to that project page you can keep as you said like talk about new things you're doing and like it becomes this like little site for you to keep sharing your work with people as well so just a tip to keep that in mind for after you launch your project and you make the thing you can still keep it keep telling that story later on yeah people have this like sense of ownership over it that I didn't expect when I started but then I kind mm -hmm. of discovered is that they're not just doing a transactional, like, I'll give you $20 and I'll get a book, but they are so invested and so, like, they're, I think a lot of people really welcome the good news and the bad news and just, like, just hearing about things that are happening. Yeah. It's well, that's lovely. a great transition to this blindingly white slide. Backers, <laughs> not a crowd, a community. This is basically just Thanks. an opportunity to talk about, like, outreach and promotion and building this community around your project. Um, Ray, obviously you've had multiple projects and you talked a little bit about like being able to build momentum that way over the course of multiple projects. But you know, how did you guys find your backers? Uh, how did you find, like, was it through, obviously you did, you've been doing a web comics, you've sort of been building a following that way. Was it through, you know, your sort of social media channels? Was there, were there other things you did to sort of spread the word and bring people on? This goes to all of you. All right, <laughs> well, I think, um, anthologies have some really good advantages in terms of outreach because, I mean, there's about 40 different creators who all contributed comics to this. And so, I mean, I have my social media presence, which is, you know, it's okay. Don't be uh, d yeah, but so, you know, I pretty much insisted that all of my contributors share it on their channels and that really helped and I mean, also I just tried to think about the groups that were going to be interested in this, you know, because it's comics that has, I mean, there's tons of news sites and blogs that cover comics. But you also have the games community. Right, page. yeah. It's also about, you know, gaming and like many different types of gaming. So I tried to like email those sites. And also it like has an aim as a feminist project. So, you know sites that cover more women-focused stuff like Jezebel or Autostraddle. I tried to talk to them. Um, yeah. what, <laughs> what was the question? All right. Ray, how about you? <laughs> um, this is still like the most mysterious part of the thing to me because, um, you know, I, I've, I've been uh, crowdfunding in some way since like 2008. And it always started with reaching out to people I knew who already were invested in me and would support me to begin with. And that's like building your base. And then from there, basically trying to figure out how you can extend out through them. You know, if you know, you know, I know people who have, like, I, there's an article about my first Kickstarter on my dad's Buddhist priest's friend's blog where he talks about like it's really tangentially related but he like did a big push to his community about it um and and i guess i guess i guess facebook and twitter um but uh i don't know i am not i'm not sure how much that actually like i feel like a one-on-one -on -one, like hey i'm doing this and will you come along with me is a lot m more valuable than like a you know, I'm writing this to a thousand people in, an e in a batch email, or here's a passive status update that is like between two Arby's ads on Facebook. Um, so I, I think I think the way to start anyway. I don't know how it works once it gets rolling, but I think the way to start is like to talk to people who you know and who might be interested, 
one on one. That's that's always how I recommend starting. And I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there is this community that's building. Like, you can't really just put up a project and tell no one and expect it to people to just find it. But if you start telling people, then word can spread. And the most fun, addictive part, I think, it's great to like hear from family and friends who are like, I'm so interested in what you're doing. I had no idea. And they support the project. But when you see just strangers who are like, I have no idea how this person saw this, but now they want to read my comic, like it's very exciting. Yeah. What do you think, Molly? Um, yeah, so I, so I do this web comic. And I published it online um, for free. I drew like two pages a week. Um, and I did it for about two years before I launched a Kickstarter. And so that was kind of two years of like doing this project and not aiming to make any kind of money off of it at all. Um, and that's like really hard advice to give. But I think it really worked um, because I and my collaborator um, built this audience who knew that we had already produced the book. Like we'd already, it was already there and they could read it. And they knew that we updated regularly. And so we would be kind of responsible with like their, their backing. Um, and so if there's like, if you can sort of carve out a way in your schedule to do something that is like, like it should be your passion. It should be like something that it doesn't feel like a labor to do. It should be something that it feels like a joy to kind of carve this time out after work and after school to draw a little bit each day and like, just like force yourself to put it out there. Um, if you can do that and you have a love of it, people will find it. And I think that like, the passion that you put into it will um, really communicate itself to other people. Um, and so you can kind of, for me, it was this like putting it out there and giving this thing out for free for two years and then um, being like, hey, um, I'm a person. Do you want to like give me some money to make a book and survive? Um, and there were all these people out there who wanted to do that, um, which was really cool. So. That's a great sales yeah. pitch. I'm a person. <laughs> we can all say that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, let's just, let's, if you guys have any questions, start thinking of them. I'll throw one, one more question out here, and then we'll just, anybody who's got a question, let's take them. Um, uh, this is a question that's pretty standard among, you know, Kickstarter creators, but, like, what do you wish you knew beforehand, you know, that you've learned from your projects, or, or what's that first piece of advice, like, the most essential thing you tell people, like, you have to know this? I think doing this stuff for free is like what I tell everyone. Like, build, have people know who you are. Don't have your Kickstarter be the first time you've ever put anything on the internet, because like you just you have to have some sort of reputation or some sort of resume. Um, the other like the other thing I wish I'd done differently was just like fewer rewards and a little bit simpler. Um, kind of, I think the next one I do I'll definitely consolidate and streamline it just for shipping purposes because um, it got really complicated. So keep it simple. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm piggybacking here a little bit, but I, I don't know if you have to have built an incredible web presence. Uh, I think you do have to have it be your passion, and then you do have to have it be something like, you know, you're going to do this. With, with, whether or not it's a Kickstarter, this is a thing that you want to bring into the world. I, I talk to a lot of people who are like, I have this great idea for a Kickstarter, and it, it's like, once I get that money, it's going to be awesome. It's like, well, what have you actually done? And and I, I think there's some phrasing on the on the site that says like, be as close to done with the project as you can before you launch yeah. your Kickstarter. I mean, that's not a requirement, but it's good advice. No, yeah. You certainly can start very early in your process and launch your project, but then the burden of communication kind of shifts. You just have to be really upfront and really talk about your progress. But generally, having something to show is is pretty essential. Just to be it. I mean, it'll help you a lot to even just have a few images to show or something. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely an advocate of getting everything done first. Uh, with an anthology, it's a little hard because of, I mean, I wanted to pay the contributors because just I care about what they're doing and I think that's the fair thing. But um, in order to have the entire thing done and the entire proof of concept before the Kickstarter started, I had to you know, tell all the contributors, well, here's how much you're going to get paid after it gets funded. And, you know, I understand some people can't do that, or there will be some artists who wouldn't want to participate under those circumstances. But um, I don't know. I think it really worked out to have everything done up front, and that allowed me to get a lot of the press and reviews that I did 
That's true. It does make it easier to get a review if you have a finished book. To right. <laughs> in terms of mistakes, uh, I guess I'll find out when it gets into the fulfillment <laughs> phase. You know, I'm not out of the woods yet, but I don't know. I definitely <laughs> learned a lot by you know, studying Molly's Kickstarter and the Kickstarters of a lot of other people who'd done comics anthologies yeah. and that's really important. Got like, a lot of yeah. advice there. That is pretty basic advice. If you want to run a project, look at some projects yeah. and see what you like. That's a great way to start. What yeah, do you think you is can effective? Probably find a project that's doing exactly what you want to do and just succeeded really well and like take their format and that's fine. <laughs> like There you go. Take their yeah. format. Steal. Um, right. Always recommend it. Picasso recommended it, right? Something like that. As long as it's just the format, but not the content. Exactly. You know? um, that was a, that's actually one other thing I wish I had known. I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, uh, budgeting your time for how long this project is going to take. Um, in, when you set up your Kickstarter project, you're going to say the estimated delivery time for your product when they're going to get their thing. Um, and I always. Uh, under budget. I always think, oh, you know, if I just focus, I can do this in a month, and I'll send it out, and it's going to be awesome. Um, and and the inverse of the fact that you're dealing with real humans on the other side of this is that for me, every day past your deadline when you said you would have it, every day you were late is like kind of just unpleasant and feeling like you owe something that you have not delivered. And I think if you can give yourself a little bit more time and just say, you know, and and never say it's going to be there by Christmas. Uh, because then you're like, not only have, have I like not done what I said I would, but I also like ruined like <laughs> Tiny Tim's present, and he's not getting his ukulele. So, um, yeah. Avoid Christmas. Sage advice. Uh, anybody have any questions for our esteemed panel? Check. So I was going to ask a question based off of that because I had a, a similar campaign, um, but I didn't meet the deadline. And then I've kind of shied away from doing it again because I feel some of that guilt you're talking about. So I was wondering, it sounds like you've done a few campaigns. So when you did your second one, <clears throat> what kind of lessons did you learn from your first? And how did you deal with kind of like getting past that deadline and then giving back and, and getting up and doing it again? Well, my second one didn't get funded. Um, so that the big lesson of the second one was make things look beautiful and colorful early because it was all line drawings and it didn't sparkle. Um, but that one I, I actually converted because my first Kickstarter I did, I, I did it as an oil painting and I told people it would be there in December and in January I thought, estimated I had about two years left of work before <laughs> I would be done with this thing and I wound up sending out a product that I'm still not like super stoked about. Um, and the second one, I, I, I was like, okay, no oil paint. It's going to be drawn in pen. It's going to be colored digitally. Um, so figuring out how, what ways you can shorten the process is, is good. Um, and that one, I think, when it finally, in the third Kickstarter, where I finally funded the project from the second one, I think it did ship uh, within its timeline. I also I just want to emphasize that Ray has done nine projects. One of them didn't make it, but... He still went on to have, you know, eight more successful ones. So I, I, people are often daunted by the all or nothing thing. Like, well, what if I don't make it? Like, that's not, that's not the end at all. In fact, it's safer because you didn't make it, so you didn't have to make this thing. Uh, you know, you can try again, and obviously it can be successful many times over. So don't be daunted. And I think a lot of, I think that most people, especially people who are like, veteran Kickstarter backers um, understand that like they're not buying something they're like pledging to a project and like it'll come when it's done and like I think that my rewards got there in time but I had a lot of people who were like I can't believe that these got here when you said like no other Kickstarter I've ever backed like did that and so I think it's like very much people understand that it's a work in progress and as long as you're honest about delays and like keep them informed and like let them know that you didn't just like run off with their money. Um, but, like, it, it'll be okay. And set a, <laughs> set a, give yourself more time, way more time than you think you need, sure. and then blow yeah. people's minds when you're oh early. My God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I think a bunch of my books are in libraries now, which is good. <laughs> huh? 
Huh? What was the library? Um, I don't know. I, um, my book, after it was backed, uh, got picked up by a publisher to be distributed. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure that they send it to a bunch of libraries because people send me photos of it in libraries. So <laughs> I hope it's in some around here. That would be cool. <laughs> Sometimes it's a matter of just hearing from a library that wants <laughs> your oh, book. Sure. But uh, any library that wrote to me, I would be like so so happy to send them a copy. And libraries are great about uh, building their their comics and graphic novel section these days. In fact, um, uh, Karen Green, who's a librarian for graphic novels at Columbia University, I believe, will be at um, our panel on the twenty second of this month. So come ask questions about libraries. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Were you guys finding that? A majority of your backers were just coming directly from the Kickstarter community because I've been focusing more on social media, uh, but I haven't gone on Kickstarter yet to actually promote it, so I'm not familiar with the actual Kickstarter community itself. Um, certainly not a majority, but I think about 26% of my backers ended up getting directed to it through Kickstarter. like looking at staff picks or popular projects or just browsing the category of comics. Um, I mean, in a sense, there's not much that you can do to like force your project to be a staff pick. So I feel like just you know, putting it out there on social media or whatever channels that you do have is smart. And then you know, the backers that you get off of Kickstarter are kind of like a bonus. It makes up for the fee they take. There you go. And you can actually see when you run a project, there's like a dashboard. You can see generally where people are coming from, how they're finding your project. It's a little, uh, you know, it doesn't have fine-grained detail, but you can see like, oh, they found it on Kickstarter. They found it in the comics section. They found it on Facebook or something like that. But um, in terms of, I'll just speak to the staff pick thing because I'm on staff and I get to pick projects. Anybody here who works here can recommend a project, but um, it actually will generally make relatively little difference unless like if your project is the kind of thing that is inherently going to go viral and catch on with people then it's going to do that anyway it might just be amplified by putting it out there in that way but in comics in particular all it really takes to be a staff pick is just make a good project like show what you're doing be sincere like it's a pretty high percentage of uh, recommended projects in comics and comics is also for as as big as Kickstarter is in the comics world the comics category is pretty small compared to other categories so there's only so many live projects I would love to see it be more and more and more more people making comics but like if you have a good comics project it will stand out people will find it it's very easy to see all comics projects so it's really just like making something good and telling people about it but social media was really important also, I think. I think like it's hard to network on Kickstarter because there's not like a public forum really. And I would definitely get those like random emails being like, hey, Actually, like, check out. Actually, that's not true anymore. We just launched Sorry. Uh, Campus. There's a Q&A <laughs> thing so you can ask questions and talk oh, to people. Oh, that's awesome. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, but I but also I would get like as a creator I'd get like the random emails being like, "Hey, check out my project. Could you promote it or something?" And like I think that's kind of weird through Kickstarter cuz it's just like it's just like very weird and random, but like if you have like a Twitter, like Twitter was invaluable for me and Tumblr like just building up those presences and like communities where it's really natural to talk about your stuff and talk about other people's stuff and like it felt a lot more natural than yeah. <laughs> Ray, I think you're actually in a good uh, position to speak to like the community on Kickstarter, especially having done a bunch of projects over a length of time. Like, did you see more people coming from different places as you went on, or did things consistently come from your existing network, or what did you see? I mean, there's a core of people now who, when I go back and make an update to all, uh, to do this, I, I'll update each of the old projects and say there's a new one. And there's a core of people who are just migrating forward with me. I mean, I think there are people who have been there at, at every project, and I feel like I just count on them now. I mean, I've, I've got Christmas presents sent to me from them. They sent me a Marvel Select Spider-Man toy. Oh my god! Um, but uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know where the new people come from. I, I don't understand. I really don't understand how it happens. I know how to tell. I know how to tell my mom to go there and do it. And I know how to talk to people who I've already talked to about it. Um, and then I just hope that they tell people, and I ask people to tell people, and I, and I and I just kind of assume that like, you know, if I just start being really active and like you know running my mouth a lot, like people take notice and. 
you know, it's gravity. Like, you know, you start, uh, you start building it with the things you already have and then more stuff will be drawn to it. You're posting on Kickstarter a lot, is that what you're saying? Yeah, for, for while I'm running a project, I just use Kickstarter as my like primary blogging platform and anything I think about the project just goes on there. And I've never had anyone say I update too much. I've had people say I Facebook post too much or blog post too much, but nobody's ever said, hey, can you lay off the like Kickstarter <laughs> updates? So. It's also like um, when I was posting to other social media to tell them about it, I would always make sure to emphasize that like, if you can't back it and you can't financially fund it, that's like 100% okay. But if you want to contribute, just share it around. And like, because it feels weird sometimes to talk about like sharing things on social media, like, hey, could you please share this? But like, if you're just upfront and like, it would help me, if you want to help, but you don't have money, but you would like to aid my project, just tweet about it. And like that, I think like, I think that a lot of people shared it because like, I just asked them to. And that's another great thing for like the interesting one dollar. If you have an interesting one dollar pledge, a, a, what you see a lot cool. is that people come in at one dollar. Like they're like, oh, one dollar, that's okay. And then as you're updating, they're like, oh, that's cool. like, yeah, let's. You get five dollars, sure. And then like, mm -hmm. I've had people who went from like you know a five dollar pledge to a hundred and fifty dollar pledge over the month, oh as they were as they like got turned on by it. So having like an easy access and like here's how you can be a part of this for very minimal is a good thing. Yeah. Jamie, here. Hi. Yes. Um, hi. Um, so my question is this. If a cartoonist uh, creator is used to uh, utilizing alias for their work, is there a way to use that on a Kickstarter project instead of a, a real name? Uh, you can set your account name to be whatever you want. There is like, you have to verify your identity and that is like in your bio that name is displayed just for transparency's sake so that people can, you know, there so is a person would be, responsible. So that would be public, uh, not just Yeah, it's not like front and center on your project, but if someone wants to look for it, they can find it, though you can, you know, name, run your account under whatever name you choose. Oh, although I know, like, uh, you know, if you have a team, I just know that Steve Ditko did a comics project like a year ago. He's done many, actually, yeah. weirdly enough. This is the guy who co-created Spider-Man with Stan Lee. Very interesting projects as well. Weird. Very <laughs> Anne Randian, like, uh, weird. Um, but, but I think he has his project manager, who's actually the name on there. So, mm -hmm. so it's a Steve Ditko project, but the project creator is Robin Snyder or something. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, I think you could have a co-pilot whose name is on there and then just have the artist's name. That happens pretty often. There'll be a, a team and, you know, one person will be the name on the account, you know, yeah. that, that's handling the project, but there might be many people actually creating the project. That being said, using a false name, I think, like, you want to make sure that if people are like, all right, I'm about to give money to this person, let me just Google search them to make sure that they're real, to make sure that there's, like, some record, you know, that you are a real artist producing work. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that it doesn't, because I just, I think that like when people are pledging money to something and they don't know if they're going to get it or not, you want to do everything possible to make them feel secure and feel like you're responsible, so. Yeah. It speaks back to that, be honest, products should be honest and clearly presented, mm -hmm. you know, we really do, you know, encourage and require even uh, transparency and yeah. honesty and you'll wind up having a better experience because of it. Are we running out of time? Okay. Okay. Two more, all right. <laughs> yes. I'm just really curious about how you found a publisher and then incorporating the cost of publication into how many you were going to produce based on hopeful you know, donations you got and then how you incorporated that into your goal price. I know I just, I think I asked nine questions in one, <laughs> but it's all with the central theme of like, the publishing component. Publishing. Yeah, do, do you mean a, a printer? Yeah, sorry, okay, a printer. Yeah. Um, I really recommend I recommend to everyone for comics projects to check out printninja.com. They approached me. I know that Hazel printed with them too. Mm -hmm. Did you print with them too? Okay, yeah. They're just a they are a printer who is like very clearly trying to build their structure around like small like kickstarted projects and they have like a million options and they give you a discount usually if you're doing a kickstarter. Um, so they're cool. There's some there's other printers out there um, that you can do a little research for, but they were the best for the money. Um, and when I was calculating costs, I just calculated that everything would be, like I, I calculated very low, so I was like 
say that like like 50 people back this, like what's the what's the minimum that they would each have to pledge to make it happen? And kind of like just being very kind of um, I guess like pessimistic in your numbers, um, even if you're optimistic in the way you're writing the project. Um, so and just always assume that fewer people will back it and that things will be a little more expensive than you think they'll be. Um, and then hopefully you'll be proved wrong. Yeah, when people ask me about setting your goal, I say, what's the minimum you need to yep. do what you're setting out to do? Then add a little bit yep. for margin of error and then go from there. Because you can always raise more, infinitely more than you ask for, but you can never raise less. So start with like, what's the, what do I need to do what I really want to do here? And you can be ambitious about it, but you know, try to be realistic too and you can always go well beyond that. I think we had one other question as well. Um, my question, sorry. Actually, my question is for Jamie. Hello. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, um, you said, you've always said that anthologies do really well on Kickstarter. They do. Testament to that right here. Right. Can Jamie you, Bikini did really well. Can you, um, can you give us, um, I guess, sort of a percentages in what's the difference between anthologies as opposed to not anthologies? Oh, that, I'd have to look that up. I don't know the actual percentages. But I do think it's a great sign of the strength of Kickstarter that typically traditional comics publishers will tell you, we don't want to publish an anthology. Anthologies don't sell. But anthologies in general do extremely well on Kickstarter, largely because, as Hazel said, there are a number of different contributors. And they're all like, Kickstarter is all about building a community around your project. And they're all bringing their own communities to it. So it has this amplifying effect to bring you know, more people to the project. So I think that's one reason why. And they're just, there's a lot of good anthologies that make their way to Kickstarter. I don't know. Yes, well, I'll be hanging around if anybody has additional questions. And stick around for 201. They may get into some of the stuff you're about to ask, too. Let's hear it for Molly and Ray and Hazel. Thank you very much. And before you, that's me, you guys. Before you go, a couple of quick resources. We have a creator handbook on site that covers some of the basic stuff that we did here. Um, we also have Campus, which I mentioned, kickstarter.com slash campus. If you've ever hit the start button, you're a creator, you can ask questions there. Um, uh, our YouTube page is going to have content like this for you. Um, we have a, a Kickstarter Tips Twitter account. It's just twitter.com slash kickstarter tips. Learn all kinds of stuff. If you have a question about comics, you can write to comics at kickstarter.com. I'll see all those emails if you want to ask me a question or something. And that's it. Thank you very much for coming and for your questions. Thank you, guys.